Well, I'd like to uh, also um, uh, acknowledge that we're on the land of the Gadigal people and the, uh, of the EOR nation and that this site has for a uh, long time been a site of gathering and learning. So it is auspicious that uh, the university is built on this site. I've been here at the university um, since late January, early February, in the uh, Center for Cultural Competence as their first distinguished chair, Fulbright chair. And this is a, a position that was funded by both the university and the Fulbright Commission. So uh, it, it shows you the importance of the work that the government thinks is happening here and I wanted to be a part of it. Now, I'm a cultural anthropologist by training who is also a vice chancellor for diversity and inclusion at the University of California in Riverside. So one of the reasons I wanted to come was to get a sense of how another uh, multicultural nation was centering its work around transformational change uh, uh, around diversity and inclusion and dealing with tough issues like <coughs> how to include people who've been excluded structurally and how do you do that in institutions that were built to exclude people in the first place, right? So we're talking about a history of tradition of elite higher education. So when I saw what was happening here at Sydney, I wanted to be, uh, I wanted to look at it more closely and I wanted to look at it for what it might tell us in the US about how we can move forward in an environment that is, that is fraught. And last week I gave a talk, which is also online, about uh, the structures of higher education and how higher education is trying to deal with this issue. Today I wanna talk about what is happening in the environment, political environment, in which we're trying to do this work which is also very, very difficult. And we're trying to move forward and to learn from what is going on here. So getting into the introduction, um, <coughs> the role of, uh, so I'm gonna be talking about universities as sites for uh, strengthening civil society. And the fact that even though we talk about it in the US, this has been contested ground since the federal laws of the civil rights movement. So it isn't as though the laws were passed and the uh, country began to say, okay, let's just all do this. <coughs> and while research universities, and this is interesting because I'll come back to research, have been sites for teaching and learning and creating new knowledge, only recently have we begun to embrace and value the operational aspects of this. That is, we've talked about it, and now institutions are moving into an environment in which they're trying to enact it. And this is where we're running into trouble. Because it has been a 40-year plan of conservatives in the United States, political, economic, and social conservatives, to influence and infiltrate colleges and universities to counteract to counteract <laughs> the more progressive liberal teachings of the free speech movement of the 70s, the 80s cultural wars, the 90s shift to e e uh, critical epistemologies, including uh, critical race theory and pushing back against neoliberal economic uh, kinds of theories that have not been working for a lot of people for a long time. So what we'll do is explore how Trump uh, since before Trump was elected, a lot of stuff gets put on him, right? But before he was elected, the Tea Party <coughs> wing of the Republican Party and what is now called the alternative right, which used to be called white supremacists, um, have supported the development of right-wing think tanks and media outlets to spread alternative wow. information about the perils of multiculturalism, right? I mean, this is not a good thing. So I also look at how the election of President Trump only deepened those ideas. He did not create them. 
It only deepened those ideas on the right that the left and left-leaning universities are peddling damaging ideas of feminism, multiculturalism, uh, diversity and inclusion, uh, critical and postmodern theories at the expense of the rest of the country and that nobody is listening to the voices on the right. So to a certain extent, that's true, but uh, so the negative, narr in the negative immigration narratives did not begin with Trump, but he was able to amplify them and he's giving voice to people who <coughs> felt they have been silenced by the forces of political correctness. And I'll come back and talk about that a little bit. So there is a more virulent resurfacing of this conservative backlash around political correctness and academic freedom on campuses. And this is what you see causing the protests, the student violence, and even deaths within the last two weeks of students who feel empowered to do things in the name of the, the, the new uh, government and the new uh, social space, civic space, in which these conversations are taking place. So I'll end by showing resistance, <laughs> a few universities that are holding their ground and moving forward with their diversity and inclusion integration strategies despite uh, the attack on US institutions mm -hmm. from the right. So it's almost as if, the, if this had happened 25 or 30 years ago, there might have been a chance to slow this down. But it's happened in 2017 and the, the reality is uh, <coughs> there's a lot of pushback and it's this pushback in the, uh, on the campuses and in the public spaces that are going to lead, in my opinion, to more conflict before it gets better. So part one, pre-Trump buildup. <laughs> uh, between 1980, 1890 and 1914, between 15 million immigrants entered the United States, almost as many as had entered the country in its entire history to that point as immigrants. We know there were indigenous people who were already there, and we know there were other indigenous people brought over from Africa. But this is the second wave of, of immigrants. And it was Teddy Roosevelt that didn't like, at that point, um, people of color, including the Japanese, who he had to deal with in Asia. But he wanted, in his term as president, to increase German and British stock and not other stock. Uh, a, a eugenicist by the name of Madison Grant wrote a book, The Passing of the Great Race, in which he advocated that the uh, greatness of the US was being diluted with lower quality whites at that time, he called them. And these referred to as Jews and people from Southern Europe. But what's important about this book is that this book was a part of the eugenicist movement and it undergirded the race science at that time in the United States, which <laughs> meant that it had policy implications. It had implications for people in uh, not only business, but in politics and in religion. Um, and <clears throat> the white nationalists of the 20th century and the 21st century go back and use these writings to help uh, make the case. Uh, and one example is Dylan Roof, the white nationalist who used the writings from this book to make the case why he killed nine black churchgoers in Charleston, South Carolina last year, if you remember that case. He had, if you went to his website, he had his writings, he had all the things. He said it's important for us to start race wars here. And this is 20, uh, <coughs> 15, last year. This is an a example of the kind of books um, that were out during that time. This is a great conspiracy against our race, Italian immigrant, things from Italian immigrant newspapers and the construction of whiteness, and it was focused on Italians. They were from Southern Europe. Again, it's the Southern Europeans. And here's one that was from <coughs> Britain, I mean Irish, but the British had an issue with Irish, and Irish had an issue with Britain 
British because the Irish felt the British had colonized them, which they had. But, so it wasn't a fe feeling. And the, that kind of handbill, no Irish state apply, was the same, was the model used by, <coughs> excuse me, uh, people in the Jim Crow South to, during the era of segregation in the South, Southern part of the United States for uh, blacks, African Americans. So there was a precedent in looking at other European populations. And the depictions of Southern Europeans versus Northern Europeans show them as being more swarthy and more peasant looking and not as sophisticated as the Northern Europeans. So there was already uh, built into the US narrative this notion that some of us are more white than others and some of us should have more opportunity than others. And that's the point. Uh, this is uh, <coughs> uh, Madison Grant, hi. And this is just one quote. There are m many very interesting quotes. But, and this has to do with intelligence. And you'll see this come up again in the 80s and the 90s and the 2000s. This is one author that just keeps coming up over and over again um, who wrote the book The Bell Curve about the in, in intellectual inferiority of African Americans and, and Latinos in the United States, which has been refu was refuted back in the 80s, but it still keeps surfacing over and over again, that, that trope. Uh, and here it says that most of the positions of leadership, influence, and prominence in the Negro race are held not by real Negroes, but by mulattoes, many of whom have very little Negro blood. And if you think about what are the things that US, Australia, Britain, and Canada have in common, is that this race narrative was going on among all these four countries at this time. This race narrative was going on. They were reading the same books. They were looking at the same policies. So there's no coincidence that you see some of the same kinds of um, solutions to these problems being the removal of kids, students, I mean, uh, kids from their homes, stolen generation, removal of Native Americans from their lands, taking them to schools. There was a global conversation happening about whiteness at that time and who would be in control and who would be in power. And the eugenics movements, those of you who study it know that it was also used in Europe to bolster some of the claims that Hitler was making about the Aryan race. So part one of, is the pre-Trump buildup po political right, <coughs> as I said, has been raging wars against liberal academics. And it was a lot more subtle than it is now. And what they did was to fund a number of think tanks and training institutes that offered conservative alternatives to researchers and endowed fellowships for graduate students and training for journalists um, to stop the takeover of U.S. universities and cultural institutions with left-leaning ideologies. Because also at that time was a fear of communism or socialism, right? How, we, how do we stop the universities from promoting, fomenting socialism and pushing these kinds of things? I remember being a young academic uh, in the 80s when uh, Alan Bloom's book, The Closing of the American Mind, came out. And if you took any class um, on Western traditions, there was, it was all the same uh, people. There were no women, there were no people from any other backgrounds in these books. And what was happening was a push to include other voices. But this was a major, major uh, controversy that happened in the 80s. Uh, Roger Kimball's book, Radicals, How Politics Has Corrupted Our Higher Education, 1990, and Dinesh D'Souza's book, A Liberal Education, The Politics of Race and Sex on Campus. What was happening, uh, they were alleging that political interests had infiltrated the university, and this was not real scholarship. This was political uh, uh, bantering <coughs> and we had to stop it and get back to real education, where we were talking about Aristotle and um, the Western canon, and though that was what real scholarship was about. So there was a pushback against this, because 
there were the development of studies on campuses, the development of black studies and Chicano studies and Native American studies and women's studies did come out of political movements. They were political. And it was the students that pushed for these changes on campus. So there was, in fact, a shifting that was taking place in the academy. And while political uh, wars were won and lost in the ballot box, these hearts and minds kinds of um, struggles were happening in the classrooms where students were receiving new knowledge, critical knowledge, knowledge they hadn't seen before. Uh, LGBTQ uh, studies, uh, ethnic studies, women's studies. Also, the demographics were shifting. Uh, so were canons and so were curricula. So there was a fear on the right that the hordes were going to be taking over the universities. I'll, pu I'll put it that way. So the slant from the right was very political and it wasn't neutral. The universities, universities were accused of being political and not neutral. But the right was doing exactly the same thing. And they were calling it scholarship. They were calling it the normative, the normative of what should be happening. Um, <coughs> and this is an article in The Guardian, uh, Political Correctness, How the Right Invented a Phantom uh, Enemy the conservative right invested millions of dollars in scholars and research to control what happened on campus, in politics, <coughs> and the media. I don't know if you've heard of these guys, the Koch brothers. They're um, industrialists, billionaire industrialists, who kind of like to play, fly under the radar screen. This is kind of a funny thing. Um, and they give money to these think tanks and to fellowships and scholarships, but they like to remain anonymous because they don't want people to be able to trace back to them what they do. Because on the one hand, they also give some scholarships to uh, Native American universities and historically black colleges and universities. So they're, you know, they're doing both of these things. But anyway, I, I cut this off, but it says, um, this was about the Bush administration. Use the glorious Bush tax cut uh, to create thousands of jobs, at least that's a trickle-down effect, right, from that era. And then the funny part of it, and this is meant to be, yes, in Mexico, Sri Lanka, India, Malaysia, China, and Vietnam. So even back uh, <coughs> during the Bush administration, the jobs that were cut were cut by organizations and companies like this not by immigrants, not by people coming in, taking jobs, not by people who were seeking a better life or a new life within the US, but it was portrayed as <coughs> other people taking, their, taking the jobs. The other uh, person was the Olin Foundation. And this foundation was set up uh, to provide support for projects that reflect or are intended to strengthen economic, political, and cultural institutions upon which the American heritage, as if there's one, right, of constitutional government and private enterprises based. So the foundation also seeks, this is their mission, seeks to promote a general understanding of these institutions by encouraging the thoughtful study of connections between economic and political freedoms and the cultural heritage. So if you think about signals that are sent, it's like whose cultural heritage, whose American heritage are we talking about here? <coughs> Mayer uh, wrote a book called Dark Money, The Hidden Histories of the Billionaires Behind the Rise of the Radical Right. And it documents how these billionaires, like the Koch brothers and the Olin Foundation, funded people and research to create what they called a right counter intelligentsia. So not just pushing back, but pushing back with their own theories and their own ways of seeing the world. And this is what a lot of the alt-right people are using today as their scholarship to put down uh, the work of, of diversity and inclusion and work like that. So it's couched in scholarship that is uh, supported. 
So this support was a part of a broader political program, you have to understand, to forge a new political conservative agenda among three groups, white working class, small business owners, and politicians that had corporate support, like the Koch brothers and these billionaires, but behind the scenes. And the strategy was to make fun of the new scholarship, like feminism, minority scholars, particularly women of color were, were, were picked out, people like Alice Walker, Toni Morrison, and to appeal to white people who were suspicious already of multiculturalism and globalization. And they were the first group, this alternate intelligentsia, to use the term PC, politically correct. It, it was not something that, it was something that was thrown into the mix to like confuse what was happening. And so it's like the, the, the right using civil rights language to talk about their position. It's the same thing that the, li the liberals are politically correct. Well, what does that mean? There is no definition for what it means. So what was at stake to Trump presidency? So by the time Trump ran for president, there was already a political and ideological infrastructure in place for him to tap into. So it was there, waiting for somebody to come along like him. And the focus was on problems of reverse racism, which the, these group, groups had identified, Islamophobia since 9-11. The fall of the economy in 2008 was about, you know, these others coming into the U.S. and the loss of jobs for working class whites, both in the Rust Belt and in the coal mining country. So this was the narrative. These folks blame foreign and domestic others for their economic problems. And by that time, they had built a media complex and outlets that reinforced the, what the scholars were doing by blaming domestic people of color for, bringing, for being lawless and getting more handouts from the government than they deserve. This is the welfare queen kind of syndrome, right? Uh, so it was all orchestrated. None of this happened by, ha happened by, by accident. So all he had to do was to tap into the dissatisfaction that was already there, just lurking beneath the surface to expose this kind of nationalist uh, populism that we saw in Britain with Brexit, right? That we nearly saw in France. And um, the question is, well, you know, what do all these things have in common? Well, all these things have in common is that globalization and the corporatization has left behind a whole group of people who have been told they were privileged by virtue of the color of their skins. So they got left behind. So there was a surfacing of this nationalist uh, populism. And <clears throat> as an anthropologi anthropologist, I'm particularly taken by this, Victor Gomez Miaga, who studied populism in the Mediterranean countries, Italy, you know, Portugal, that whole area, uh, as well as in Latin America. And he said about the U.S., xenophobia and the problem of racism and intolerance of immigration, Trump supporters, is not only the province of the undereducated, which was the initial analysis of what happened in the U.S., right? It was that, well, it's the uneducated, working class, poor, white men and women who voted for Trump. There were more middle-class, college-educated whites that voted for Trump. And there was another article today that said that. But there, what, there is a historical and structural problem with um, uh, white nationalism that continues. And we see the rise of hate groups, neo-Nazis as well as others. Uh, from <coughs> there have been from 300,000 to over 2 million um, a listing of uh, hate groups and, and hate-initiated instances. And during the reign of President Obama, lest you think it was the end of racism in the United States, um, according to the Southern Poverty Law Center that keeps records on these issues, hate crimes have risen fourfold. And I'll show you a um, map of that. So there are a lot of people who are not happy 
that he was elected president. So this also spurred the development of an ultra-right, xenophobic, fake news industry with the rise of um, blogs and uh, people like the Breitbart industry. Uh, <coughs> populism also was about reinforcing white identity formation. And it was based on several groups that came together around Trump. The white nationalists would have always been there and they rebranded themselves and they're respectable now. They don't have skin heads and they don't have ta uh, swastikas, they wear suits. So they're, they're respectable people now. And the Tea Party, which was founded 12 years ago, which was the right wing of the Republican Party, and the changing demographics in the United States. I come back to that. Whites in the US are facing minority status. Physically, numbers. By 2050, the United States will be a non-white nation. So that is sending ripple waves through the population as well. It's something people don't talk about, but it is there. So they see themselves as a persecuted group, especially poor working class. And poor working class white folks have been invisible to the Republicans pretty much because they were Democrats. And, and a lot of the people that voted for Trump have voted for Obama because he saved, what, the auto industry in, in Detroit. So this was another group that came on board. So you say things like, uh, after the election, the, let's say the gloves came off. <laughs> so these groups felt very empowered to say the things that they wanted to say. And one of them is that, here, diversity equals white genocide. And of course, you know, those are things we, count, we encounter on our campuses. We saw in 2016, what we saw was a politics of white racial resistance, which is a volatile mix that is changing the political right in our universities. So it's a fusion of both right-wing politics and white nationalists, which have been separate before, really. On the new political right, there was little tolerance for inclusion, and the idea of colorblindness is what they embrace. That is, we had nothing to do with what's going on today in communities of color, so we're not gonna feel guilty, and we are the ones that are the victims right now. On the left, we're, uh, we, and, and, and more progressive left, pushing multiculturalism. So there's a clash. There's a clash right there, and these ideas are being played out on our campuses in the United States. Um, <clears throat> and the social media has provided another outlet, Fox News, and hi, your Murdoch-supported news, your Murdoch-supported newspapers. <laughs> um, and so that buildup has been since 2008. And so there was vitriol that came out after President Obama was president, not a, a kumbaya, uh, aren't we past race in the United States. So ultimately the Tea Party linked forces with white nationalist populists. The Tea Party wing of the Republican Party turned out to care more about race and immigration issues than about debt and fiscal constraint, which was their um, a mantra. They saw a way to defeat the Democrats and they took it. They all insist when pressed that they are not racist, sexist, or anti-immigration or anti-Muslim. They just want America back. And the question of course is back to what? What do they mean when they say that? So now I want to look at the impact on <coughs> campuses. The climate of the presidential administration has allowed or given permission for people like Richard Spencer and Ann Coulter to go to campuses to deliberately disrupt the dialogue around immigration, diversity, and inclusion. So they're reinforcing the conservative right points of view, but in the faces of, thank you, in the faces of increasingly diverse student populations. So it's, an, it's like an intentional inciting um, the right calls it an assault on intellectual diversity. The left calls it a violation of academic freedom, and both sides are using the same language to stake out their views. 
And this is where the term political uh, correctness is, is being used to shape arguments uh, where there are no definitions. So it's sort of like whatever we don't like is political correctness mm -hmm. that you're doing. And so the word caught on, he used it in his election, Trump did, and it, so uh, campus administrations are uh, scrambling. National Public Radio talks about the increased white supremacist activities on campus. Hate watch groups have tracked 150 incidents of white supremacist pop propaganda on US campuses since the fall of 2006. Prior to that, it was a rarity in terms of even keeping figures or numbers. The Anti-Defamation League, which has been a, a uh, watchdog group for anti-Semitic um, <coughs> behavior uh, in the US, says that <coughs> these folks have taken on, uh, gotten away from dangerous racist language by using such slogans as, uh, join this organization to serve your people, and our destiny is ours. They do not shave their heads or wear swastikas anymore, as I said. So this is put out by the Southern Poverty Law Center, and it shows that there are types of hate groups that grew in just one year, 2015 to 2016, and you see the anti-Muslim group is the one that grew the most, right? <coughs> not that they weren't there, but that's the one that grew the most. And then this is the month um, the month of Trump's election. You could see th the daily hate incident count, how high it was around, around that election. And once he was elected, it started going down. And people are saying, he's our man. He's there for us. And you can see the, the four largest um, crimes are committed against immigrants. And then anti-black, which is one of the reasons we have Black Lives Matter. Uh, Anti-Semitic, that's on the rise again, and anti-LGBT. So those are the four that we see. And we have all these student populations on our campuses, including the immigrants who, who are not sure whether they're gonna be deported. So on the conservative side, we have an organization called FIRE that protects free speech. Charles Murray, the guy I was telling me about, who wrote the bill, Curve, that focuses on the inferiority of blacks and their IQ, and Coulter is a conservative author, and Milo Yiannopoulos, he's an interesting guy. He's a conservative gay male who intentionally provokes the students to verbally attack him, and then he you know, brings his press with him, and he kind of says, see, I told you those are not really good people. That's a conservative. Now on the alt-right side, you have Richard Spencer, who termed the, the um, term alt-right, and he's been, he, he, he's on a university tour, um, and he said he wants to connect with white students. Uh, there's a, another organization, these are the main ones, um, called Identity Europa, and there's a hashtag, Project Siege, if you guys wanna look it up. Um, and these groups are gonna get more aggressive, and they, they set up tables, and they peddle booklets on college campuses. So you can see how it's incendiary, just them being there. And what he says is we need to change the hearts and minds of the next generation of, of students. And his ultimate goal is to help the next generation realize his, that the goal of a white only space for whites in the US, forced diversity and multiculturalism is unnatural and whites need territory that is ours, where we can be ourselves. So he's posted flyers at campuses from my mm -hmm. campus to the University of California, Berkeley, to Massachusetts, and the administrators are struggling to try and figure out what to do. But I wanna show you one uh, uh, institution uh, that is taking a position that they're not anti-immigration, they're not anti-international, and they are, have a video that, that states this, and 230, other colleges and universities in the United States have adopted this. So I want to show it to you. It's only two minutes. So we can do that. <coughs> okay, so I'll close that. Right. Okay, so that's um, 
uh, there, and I wanted to say a word about Missouri. Missouri is a, was a site of uh, riots in 2015, and these were uh, African American students that had been ignored by the administration because they were trying to figure out why they had to endure the kinds of things they did. For example, there were um, uh, nooses that the students found on their dormitory doors, and there were crosses that were burned uh, at, next to them and next to the places where they, where they lived. And the administration initially wouldn't listen and took the attitude that, well, you guys just need to toughen up and get over it. Uh, that, was, that was it. So uh, it wasn't until the football team, which was made up of, you know, a mixture of students, and the, and the coach said, we're not playing to represent this university until these issues are addressed. And it was then that the administration listened. If they hadn't played that weekend, they would have also lost a million dollars. So that might have had a little bit to do with it. <laughs> okay, five minutes. I'm almost done. It's almost there. Almost there. And then at Riverside, where I am, uh, we continue to support our DACA students. These are the students that are deferred action arrivals. And this was put in place by Obama and exempt some undocumented immigrants from deportation and provides two-year renewable work permits. And we were told we can't do it anymore. And we're doing it. <laughs> we're continuing to do it. Um, and um, sexual assault policies, uh, we were told we should ease up on them. And we said, no, we're doing, we're going to continue to do that because that affects, our, uh, that affects our student body. And then global teaching and learning, we've signed on to, you are welcome here through the, um, um, through the uh, Temple University. So what we do is more important now than ever before, and that's a point I'm trying to make. The environments in which we do this work are sometimes really, really bad. Um, and it's getting worse in the US. So one of the reasons I was interested in Sydney was to look at the approach you're taking, which is a holistic approach to, to changing university. Uh, building cultural capacity of leaders at all levels, because a lot of university leaders don't know what to do in the face of this stuff, because it's gotten so ugly and, and, and vir virulent, right? I'm not saying it's that way here, but the, the intent is to be intentional about building capacity to handle these events. Because there's more at stake in the work that we do for our students and society <coughs> than trading barbs with with nationals and, re and refuting research claims. There's a lot we're doing. What at stake, what is at stake, is whose ideas, voices, and points of view inform the next generation of students that we are recruiting to our campuses, whether we're in California or here. And the missions of our colleges and universities are broader than, narrow, than the narrow political agendas of politicians who are only thinking about the next election. So our work goes on no matter who is in political office because our mission is to help to push this experiment of creating an inclusive democracy to new heights. Thank you so much for allowing me the opportunity to spend my fellowship time here learning how the University of Sydney is doing this work. Thank you.